76 years ago today, the Allied armies stormed the beaches of Normandy, France. Keen as I am to tell you something new, or at least forgotten about D-Day, many of you may be surprised to learn that although the landings were successful, and the American, British and Canadian troops managed to fight off the beaches, and begin the process of joining the five beaches together into one large perimeter, not all the German shore defences were captured or neutralised on the 6th of June, or in the days afterwards. Though isolated, cut off and fighting hard, several German strongpoints and bunker complexes managed to hold out, at or behind the beaches, being considerable thorns in the sides of the Allies as they battled inland against German reinforcements arriving to try and contain the beachhead. And one of the most difficult of these strongholds to capture was a large complex of bunkers and emplacements located between the Canadian Juno Beach and the British Sword Beach. So important was the facility to the German war effort that its garrison would fight on for 12 days after the Allied landings, confident that German forces would counterattack and relieve them. In the end, a huge British operation was required to capture the facility, involving the use of some extraordinary armoured vehicles collectively called Hobart's Funnies and an elite Royal Marine Commando. In 1943, at Deuvre la Deliverande, the Luftwaffe had established a new radar base. It was, in fact, the primary radar in the area, and was used to control night fighters intercepting Allied bomber streams heading into Europe. The site contains state-of-the-art equipment based on two Freier FUMG and two Würzburg FUSE sets, with dishes plus an ancillary radar. The station was divided into a main and secondary site, spread over 20 acres of flat countryside, surrounded by minefields and barbed wire fences, and had a series of strong concrete bunkers for radar personnel, living quarters, a medical station, water storage and underground diesel generators. Due to its location in the heavily defended coastal zone, the station included strong defences. The main site had two 20mm Flak 38s on top of the main bunkers, as well as a 75mm artillery piece, two 50mm anti-tank guns, and a Tobruk, or Ringstand, small concrete bunker mounting a Renault tank turret with a 37mm gun. There were also two Tobruks, armed with heavy machine guns, and 16 other machine gun positions covering all directions. The subsidiary site had two 37mm Flak 43s on the bunker roofs, with two more Flak 43s on the main command bunker, and four Tobruk bunkers with heavy machine guns. Commanding this complex was Oberleutnant Dr. Kurt Egler, with 238 Luftwaffe personnel. The Dovre radar station was further protected by two infantry companies drawn from the Army's 3rd Battalion, 736th Grenadier Regiment. Number 12 Company occupied field trenches, covering the northern approach to the radar site at the villages of Dovre and Le Deliverante, and had a single mortar and 12 machine guns. Number 11 Company blocked the western approaches from Juneau Beach via the village of Tailville and was based on two so-called resistance nests, the first consisting of trenches and reinforced houses and the second a series of small concrete bunkers. Dovre radar station was intended to hold out and await relief if the Allies landed and managed to penetrate inland. This is exactly what Oberleutnant Egler did on D-Day. From the beginning of May 1944, the station had been under daily attack from thunderbolts, typhoons and spitfires, which bombed, machine-gunned and rocketed the site. 
Before the 6th of June, eight Luftwaffe radar personnel had been killed and a wooden barrack burned down, but the well-protected radars largely undamaged. On the morning of the 6th of June 1944, Dover radar station was one of many German positions that were heavily bombed by Allied aircraft and shelled by Allied warships as the invasion commenced. Egler and his men were unharmed inside their deep bunkers and the radars continued to operate. Canadian troops fighting their way off Juneau Beach clashed with Hauptmann Hans Gutsch's No. 11 Company Grenadiers defending approaches via Tailville. It was realized that the facility was very large and well defended, so Canadian troops isolated the base. Shortly afterwards, British commandos arrived from Sword Beach. The 4th Special Service Brigade was ordered to isolate Dovre, allowing other Allied forces to pass by and continue the advance on the city of Caen. Once secured, most of the commando brigade moved on to support Canadian forces, leaving 4-1 Commando Royal Marines in battalion strength to deal with the station. All along the Normandy coast in the hours and days after D-Day, remaining German strongpoints and batteries were captured or surrendered. But not Dovre. For a week after D-Day, the German defences held firm, the army grenadiers being pushed back into the base perimeter, where they assisted the Luftwaffe in defending it. 4-1 Commando made harassing attacks on the base, but could not take it without heavy support. Rocket-firing RAF Typhoons plastered the base to little effect, and a pair of Centaur tanks fired at it as well, but the heavy bunkers resisted all fire. Oberleutnant Egler was determined to hold out as he expected a counterattack by the 21st Panzer Division to recapture the area. When supplies began to run low, the Luftwaffe even managed to make a nighttime para drop into the base perimeter. With the Allies in this sector battling away at Caen, it was madness to leave a fully functioning German base astride their communication lines. The decision was taken to capture Dovre radar station and the British had just the unit to deal with the heavy German bunkers and gun positions. Hobart's funnies. Before D-Day, Major General Percy Hobart had created a series of special armoured vehicles for the landings, grouped into the 78th Armoured Division. Two of these types of vehicles would now be deployed to assist the commando's assault. On the 17th of June 1944, 12 days after the D-Day landings, the assault commenced, beginning at 16.30 hours when the Royal Artillery delivered a heavy barrage from its large 7.2-inch guns. The main attack came from the north and consisted first of 28 Sherman Krabs, special flail tanks that would clear routes through the German minefields. This unit from the 44th Dragoons lost four Krabs disabled by mines, but managed to clear paths for the next Hobart Funny, which were 17 Churchill AVREs, or Assault Vehicle Royal Engineers, that were armed with huge 290mm petard mortars. They were ideal bunker busters, the 40-pound rounds were so huge that British soldiers nicknamed them flying dustbins. The Churchills of the 26th Assault Squadron moved to suppress the base's anti-tank guns. One flying dustbin scored a direct hit on a 50mm anti-tank gun, while another flattened an open emplacement from a range of 60 yards. One AVRE was knocked out by German defensive fire and three were disabled but their fire destroyed or damaged many of the German bunkers, enabling the next phase of the assault to commence. This consisted of 4-1 Commando charging in and assaulting each bunker with grenades and demolition charges before storming inside to clear out the defenders. After some heavy fighting, the Germans began to surrender, many dazed and shocked by the attentions of the flying dustbins. 227 Luftwaffe personnel gave up, many of them wounded, along with several dozen surviving army grenadiers from the two defence companies. 
The British lost four killed and 12 wounded in the fight for Dovre radar station, and with its capture on the 17th of June, the last major German position left over from D-Day was finally subdued. Oberleutnant Egler was awarded the Knight's Cross for the defence of Dovre radar station for 12 days, the award being gazetted on the 5th of July 1944 when Egler was a prisoner of war in England. He died in Mannheim in 1987, aged 70. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.